excited that you're with us. We're going to take up the tithes and offering real fast. You can make checks out to Cornerstone Church. Of course, you can give online at cornerstoneofadrian.com. You can also install the Church Center app. You can mail a check. Again, we've got a lot of people streaming, so I'm going through all the options here. <laughs> you can mail a check to 1055 West US 223 in Adrian. We love you. We appreciate you. We call you blessed, and we call harvest on every seed that is sown. Amen. Don't forget that we are endeavoring to do a building painting project. We're getting quotes. If we can get some contractors to actually call us back, we can actually get you some verified numbers. <laughs> but we're going to start this fund. We want to get the outside of this building looking a little less like 84 Lumber, if we could imagine. Yes. So we want to get a coat of paint on there, and there's some other projects coming up as well. But give, give, give. You can give to that fund. It's just a building fund. We love you, and again, we appreciate all you do. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to come into your house. We thank you that you died for us, Father, to set us free. And I call everybody that's in the sound of my voice healthy and whole, with no foreign cell living or growing on the inside of it, Father. Thank you for the mind of Christ and the wisdom of God that you said we could have. And, Master, I even thank you that when we lay our head down to sleep, that you said you bless your beloved with sweet sleep. And so, Father, we lay down and rest without the help of medicine. We lay down and rest because of the peace that passes all understanding and a clear conscience that we have with you. Thank you, Father, that we're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We're saved and, and sanctified, Father, that we are triumph in Christ because of what you've done. Thank you, sir, that you said that you stripped our enemy and shamed him publicly. Because of what you've done, Father, we are free from the curse of sin and death and made alive into life with Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Believe. 
that you are. You're the God of me.
You're the God of miracles. I believe in you. I believe in you. You're the God of It's a great and mighty God that we serve, amen? The same Jesus that walked the planet 2,000 years ago is the same Jesus that we serve today. Amen? And so the same God that healed, the same God that rose from the grave is the same God that we serve today. And so if there's a need in your life, he is still the miracle worker today. Same Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's the God we serve, amen?
you don't leave us alone to figure it out on our own, Father. I thank you, Jesus, that you've made a way for us. I thank you for this service this morning. I thank you, Jesus, for hearts to receive the word. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Come on, greet somebody, give them some love. Kids are dismissed. I call you blessed. we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition, so you will not grow weary and lose heart.
How's everybody doing? I gotta say, I got a new appreciation for you having to play guitar and get a word for somebody. I mean, it's up there is not an easy job, and trying to watch your signs and you know let the Holy Spirit flow. And halfway through the first song to the very end, I couldn't take my eyes off of you. I'm trying to watch my signs and watch my cues and not mess up and knowing I got this solo part coming up and trying not to mess up, but I don't know what you're seeking. The Holy Spirit didn't give me a son of my business. The Lord hears you. He sees you. He sees you crying out, and what you are seeking, you will receive. The Lord has this way of giving me these words, and I always try to, ah, that's not me. I, I try to doubt. I get this fire inside that it just swells up, and I can't, I just can't hold it in. So I know from the throne room, I don't know what you're seeking, but I know that the Holy Spirit, God himself sees you and he hears you. And your prayers will be answered. Amen. That's a good spot to give the Lord a hand clap. Amen. Come on. It's good when the Lord shows up and speaks directly to us, right? Kind of reads our mail, so to speak. And I, I'll just say that I've been on the receiving end of some of Bob's words. There's times that he's come to my office through the week and said, listen, I don't want to be here. <laughs> but it's like it won't stop, you know. This fi it's like fire shut up in your bones is exactly the right, the right description of it. And so I'm just saying, whatever it is, I believe God's got it. Amen. Amen. We are talking about, and I just want to welcome everybody. Welcome. We're glad that you're with us. Again, welcome to everybody that's streaming on Facebook. We're glad that you're with us. Everybody who's watching our YouTube page through the week, we're really, gra really glad that we're able to minister to the body of Christ at large in that way. So we're grateful. Amen. We've been talking about how to survive the wilderness, and we did the first couple weeks of describing what the wilderness is and, and what that may look like. Today I want to talk about a time of testing. Let's go to Deuteronomy 8, verse 2. It says this, Remember the Lord led you. Now he's talking to the Israelites who were in a wilderness moment, right? Remember the Lord led you these 40, 40 years where? In the wilderness. Everybody see the signs? We can, we can see the screen. Everybody knows what we're talking about this morning? You there? little feedback. Okay. For 40 years where? In the wilderness. Okay, we're starting to get there. To humble you, to test you, and to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commands or not. So we have a Lord who wants to do something mighty, mighty and great and powerful in our lives, and there's little seasons that we go through that the Lord's building character, that the Lord's building faith, that the Lord's sifting out some things in our lives so that we can actually walk into the promised land that he has in store for our lives. And we need these moments. Nobody likes those moments, but bottom line is the truth is that we, we have to go through them. And so a lot of times I've seen through the years believers losing their bearing, so to speak, in the midst of this wilderness moment, and they get completely off track and never make it back to what God has been trying to do in their life the whole time. And so we're going we're, to, several weeks now, we're going to go through this and lay some key, some key principles on how to survive these moments and come out and actually walk into our promised land. It starts with understanding that these wilderness moments exist, and what is their purpose? Amen. Okay, so again, we're talking about a time of testing today. Often, I've seen through, you know, we've been doing this, got saved in 1990, been involved in church life pretty much right away, started praising worship in, in 1991, and have missed about five services since. My dad was a preacher. I grew up in church. I dated the preacher's daughter all through high school. I, all I've known is church. You understand? Uh, I, full, I went into full-time ministry uh, for free in 1997 and then actually started on paid staff in 1998. I'm a graduate of two Bible colleges. I'm just saying that I've been in church circles enough to I've seen moments where people lose track, get derailed, because they do not understand what is happening in their lives. You, you out there? You hear a pin drop. Now listen, this is not a somber message. I'm just trying to give you some keys to set you free today. Too often I've seen where we seek Jesus for the wrong reasons, and unknowingly we begin to use him. And he's reduced to, down to nothing more than, than a resource in time of need instead of Lord. 
Amen. Lord of all creation. So I want you to, if, if we can, I want you to imagine with me, if you will, imagine that you're an Israelite. Imagine that you've just recently been freed from Egypt. Uh, you've been freed from a lifetime of, of slavery. You know, generation after generation after generation, this is all your family has ever known. For 430 years, you've been slaves in Egypt. And that's all you know. And all of a sudden, you've been set free. You just experienced the ten plagues. You know, we, we all know the story, right? Moses goes into Egypt, and there's the ten plagues that God uses to set them free. Can you imagine walking through those moments where you live in Goshen, and, all, and Goshen's not experiencing the same thing that Egypt is experiencing? You're, you're watching as the nation crumbles around you, and God sets you free, and you walk out of this nation with all of the wealth. And the power of God clearly operating in your life. And now you're being chased by, you know, you're outside of Egypt and you're heading to the promised land. You're being chased by the most powerful man in your generation. To the known world at that time, the most powerful man and his army are hightailing it right behind you. And God takes you through this frightening yet exhilarating experience of walking between two walls of water. Again, imagine with me, if you will, you're an Israelite, and you're walking through this sea on dry ground. And what you're seeing in the water as you're walking beside you, only to come out safe and sound on the other side, completely dry. And you watch as those same walls come crashing in on this enemy that was just pursuing you. You watch these walls come crashing in and devastate that enemy to where you have complete and great victory. Imagine that this is you. And so you're on the other side of this sea, and you just saw this miracle take place, and you begin to dance and rejoice and celebrate because of God's delivering power in your life. You see in it? It's kind of like Paul in the New Testament, Romans 8, 31. He said, what can we say? Imagine being the Israelites on the other side of this. The enemy's just been destroyed. You're, you're celebrating and you're rejoicing. What can we say? If God is for us, who can be against us? And so as an Israelite, clearly God has been on your side. Turn after turn, mile after mile, through everything that, that you have walked through, God has delivered you time and time again with signs and wonders miraculously that, man, here we are, what? Thousands of years later, still talking about. Why would anyone ever doubt this mighty, powerful, and faithful God ever again? Now imagine just a few days later, you're tired, and you're thirsty, and it's terribly hot, and you're not on the threshold of the promised land like you thought you should be. And now instead, you're wandering aimlessly through the wilderness, again, led there by God, and it's dry. And it's filled with serpents and scorpions. And, and, and now you're not dancing. And now you're not singing unto the Lord about the horse and the rider cast into the sea. No, now you're complaining and you're pointing a finger at your leader. Saying, why in the world did you bring us out here in the wilderness? Wouldn't it have been better if we just died in Egypt? Seems ridiculous, right? I mean, literally from one extreme to the next. Of gratefulness to complete whiners. And I wonder if we've ever been there. Where we've ever doubted, ever murmured, ever complained because we didn't understand where we were at in this moment in our walk with God on the way to our promised land. Do we ever think that, man, God, God, you delivered me so mightily from the power of this enemy, and now it seems like I'm wandering aimlessly in the desert of confusion and silence? Where are you, God? You ever been there? I think most of you have, and in your walk with the Lord, I don't believe it's the last. Do we ever doubt God's purpose in our lives and ask, God, are you even watching? God, why did you let this happen? Ever been there? I'm here to tell you that the Lord has a plan for your life. And that just as the Lord led Israel out of Egypt into the wilderness to prepare them for their promised land, just like the Lord led Jesus 
into the wilderness before fulfilling His destiny. That God has a plan. And He's also leading you. And that He created you on purpose and for a purpose. That there's a purpose to His plan. There's a method to His madness, so to speak. Madness to you. There will be some, some wilderness moments. We need to get this. Understand they're going to happen. And what do we do in the midst of these things? In a nutshell, never stop trusting God. Never stop trusting God. Know that He's leading you and guiding you and directing you. Pray more than ever. Get in the Word of God more than ever. Seek Him in all, he, in all He's doing. But I'm telling you, the purpose of these dry times is to humble us and to test us and to build our faith and to, and to build character in us that needs to be there and to filter out things that shouldn't be there. Not because God doesn't know our hearts, but to show us where we are at. To show us what needs to be delivered. To show us the true nature of our hearts so we can change. Come on. Everybody look at your neighbor and say, I need to change. There's things about us that we still need to change. Deuteronomy 8, 2 again says, The Lord led you through the wilderness to humble you, to test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep His commands or not. And verse 3 says, So He humbled you. He allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna. Again, he's talking to the Israelites. How does God humble us? He humbled these Israelites by allowing them to hunger. But then the, the next part of this verse says that he fed them manna. It seems kind of contradictory. How can they hunger and be fed at the same time? Well, let's go a little deeper then. Scholars say that manna is probably one of the best food that you can eat. I've never had it. I don't know. That's what they say. Scholars say that it's the food that angels eat. Again, that's what they say. 1 Kings 19, we see Elijah, and an angel brings a cake to him to eat. And scholars believe that this cake is made from manna because angels brought it to him. Let's go a little further with that. In verse 8, 1 Kings 19, 8, it says that Elijah got up, and he ate this cake that was brought by the angel. And it says he drank, and then it says the food... Gave him enough strength to travel for 40 days. Now listen, uh, you know, Bob likes to make fun of me because I like to eat. And I'm just telling you, it takes a lot of fuel to keep this truck running. I'm about four or five hours and my stomach's growling. I have yet to eat anything that helped me endure a week, let alone 40 days. It says that, listen, it doesn't say the angels strengthened him. It says the food did. Whatever this food was, clearly more than just bread, sustained him for a 40-day journey in the wilderness. And the Israelites had an abundance of this manna. They received a fresh shipment of it from heaven every morning, and so they never missed a meal from the moment they left Egypt until they were on the edge of the promised land. Never missed a meal. So if they were eating, how is it that this verse says God caused them to hunger? Food for thought. What hunger? If they're eating, what hunger? Well, we need to consider the situation. We need to look at it from a little different perspective. Let's imagine that all you ate for breakfast every day was a loaf of bread. And at dinner, you, all you had every day was a loaf of bread. And at lunchtime, the same thing. All you had was a loaf of bread. Day after day, week after week, month after, for 40 years. No, no butter. No peanut butter jelly, no ham, no tuna, just bread. I would imagine you would probably want something else after a short time. <laughs> Agreed? Now listen, I've, I've been on mission trips around the world. I've been to Haiti, I've been to Mexico, I've been to Ukraine. I even been on a mission trip to Detroit. And I'm telling you, even that's a different culture than we live in. And I'm telling you that in all of my mission trip adventures, all of the food that we ate was terrible. Terrible. There were times we didn't know what we were eating. I'm convinced on the hills of Haiti we ate a goat one day. And I'm just telling you that if you understood where this food was being prepared, you probably would never eat. I seen it. <laughs> Bob won't even eat at certain restaurants in this town because he cleaned the kitchens. I'm telling you, in the mission field, you'd be in trouble. When I was in the Ukraine, we ate the same bland chicken soup every day for lunch. 
And I'm just telling you, at the end of all of my mission adventures, when I got home, the very first thing that I did was went and got a great big hot and juicy hamburger and kissed the waiter who brought it to me. <laughs> the food was terrible. And I'm just telling you, that's, just, that's a terrible diet for just a few days. Can you imagine for 40 years eating the same thing day after day after day over and over? It, it numbers 11, verse 4 talks about the foreign rabble. It's really this um, disorderly crowd, a little group of troublemakers, really, that's traveling with, with Israel. Began to crave the good things of Egypt. And it says the people of Israel began to complain. Oh, for some meat, that they, they exclaimed. Verse 5 says, we remember the fish. Oh, if we could just have some cucumbers. Oh, some melons, some leeks, some onions, all the garlic we wanted. Verse 6 says, our appetite is gone, and all we ever see is this manna, manna, manna. Can you see this? Can you see how God caused them to hunger with the same food day after day after day? He gave them everything that they needed, not what they wanted, but everything that they needed in that moment. And I do want to stress that this was just a moment in their history. It was never God's intention to leave them there. And that manna was never God's intention to feed them forever with. You understand? This was supposed to be just a moment. What are some other things that caused them to hunger in this wilderness? Let's look at Deuteronomy 29.5. It says that God led these Israelites again 40 years where? In the wilderness. And it says their clothes didn't wear out and their sandals didn't wear out. And we all get excited about the fact that their clothes lasted 40 years. And man, it is a miracle. But can you imagine what it must have been like to live like that? Where you're wearing the same wardrobe for 40 years, day after day after day, the same clothing for 40 years. I have some pictures here of some clothing from 40 years ago. Check these out. Aren't you glad that we don't dress like this still? Look at this next one. Check out them shorts. Man, these are cool. All the old people wanted to dress like this. And the next picture, all the young people wanted to dress like this. Look at this next one. Aren't you glad that we don't still look like this? Or this? Or this? Aren't you glad Jeff Gerald's doesn't still look like this? Forty years wearing the same clothes over and over and over. Can you imagine? Women, imagine with me, if you will. No new clothes, no new shoes, no shopping malls. Forty years wearing the same clothes. God gave them everything that they needed and not what they wanted for a season. He caused them to hunger. What's some... You, can, you better take that down now, man. <laughs> what, what's, what else did they hunger for? Does anyone else like to travel in the room? I don't really have the desire to live anywhere else, but I like to travel. I like to see different places, different cities around the world or whatever. Uh, you know, these people, they, same, they saw the same scenery. Day after day for 40 years, nothing but sand, nothing but cactus, you know, no rivers, no streams, no lakes, no beautiful smoky mountains, no forest, just sand. Hot in, the, hot in the daytime and cold at night. Sand. Deuteronomy 8, 2, again, remember how the Lord led you 40 years in the wilderness, humbling you and testing you to prove what? To prove what? What's it say? Next verse. He's trying to prove your character. He's trying to find out whether or not you're going to obey him. Verse 3 again, the Lord humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you manna. What God was doing, he was creating a hunger on the inside of you by removing anything that would satisfy the desires and the wants of the flesh while still maintaining the fundamental needs of their lives. He created a hunger to test them. What was the test? to see if they would desire Him instead of what they left behind, to see if they would seek Him or if they would chase after the things that their flesh craved. 
Would they hunger and thirst for righteousness, or would they be passionate about comfort and pleasure? Look at their response. Numbers 11.4 says they craved Egypt. And they complained. They wanted to go back to the bondage and complained. Oh, for some meat. Oh, for what we had in Egypt. Look at what we left behind. Again, it's a moment. They remembered and desired what they left behind. Now, Egypt is, is symbolic of the world system that we're supposed to be leaving behind in our pursuit of a relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and that even though this Egypt that they're, they're longing for was bondage, they wanted to go back to it. The real problem that they missed and what they did not remember again, that this wilderness was not the destination. This was a moment. It was supposed to be a temporary place on the way to their promised land. And I'm telling you, we can look at their story as examples of how to live our own lives. We can't miss this. It, it, the wilderness is not a time to murmur and complain. The wilderness is not a time to begin to cry out for the things that you left behind. That's bondage. God has a greater plan. Look at Numbers eleven eighteen. It says, Then the Lord told Moses, Say to the people, you were whining, and I heard you. That's that new translation, Pastor Bill paraphrase, in case it doesn't match up there. Oh, for some meat. We were better off in Egypt. And it says, now the Lord's going to give you meat. Verse 19 says, he's going to give you meat, but not just for a day or two or not even 20 days. Verse 20 says, you're going to eat, eat meat for the whole month. You're going to eat so much of it, you're going to gag on it. You're going to be so sick of it. Why? Because you rejected the Lord and you whined. Because you complained and desired to go back to Egypt. Like somehow God got it wrong. Look at Psalms 106, 14. Again, in the wilderness, talking about this same story from a different book. It says their desires ran wild and they tested God's patience. And it says that God gave them their request, but it came with, what's it say? A leanness of soul. We need to understand that if we don't follow God's counsel, then we're left with following our own counsel. And this approach is what left the children of Israel with a leanness of soul. That, that's an uneasiness of mind. They don't have peace in their hearts. Terror of conscience, self-reproach. I'm just giving you the definitions of that. Their soul is lean, meaning that they don't love God how they should. They're not grateful like they should be. They're not hungry and thirsting for righteousness like they should be. Their soul is lean. It means they feasted and they fed their bodies, but they left their soul to starve to death. Psalms 106.15 says, God gave them what they asked for. This is the New Living Translation, and it says, but he sent a plague with it. Sent a plague with it, and that story is confirmed in Numbers 11.33. that says, while they were gorging themselves with the meat, while it was still in their mouth, the Lord's anger burned against them, and he struck them with a severe plague. And it says in 34, they called the place the graves of gluttony because it is the place where they buried all the whiners who wanted to go back to Egypt. You see in this? Psalm 78 is still talking about this story, and it says, In spite of seeing the Lord's wrath, in spite of seeing all the wonders, it says that the people kept on sinning. Despite the wonders, they refused to trust Him. They're in the wilderness, they don't understand what's going on, and they start murmuring and complaining. They refused to stop sinning, and they refused to trust the Lord. Man, that's a four-point sermon right there on how to survive the wilderness. Keep your, keep your brain straight and trust God. They got what they wanted, but it came with a very high price, leanness of soul. Leanness of soul made their hearts so far from God that they were unfit to enter into the promised land. Let's be clear. It was not a sin to ask for meat. The request revealed their dissatisfaction with God. They didn't trust Him. They didn't trust His leading. They didn't like His methods. And that even though God was right, their request, the pressure, showed their true colors. 
in their hearts their desire to return to the former things that God had just delivered them from. They had it in their hearts and in their minds. They were convinced that what they left behind was better than what God was trying to lead them to. Are you listening? They chose a prison cell instead of the freedom God had for them. Check out this video. Wake up. What? What is happening? Are you Kevin Adams? Yeah, who are you? Kevin. We don't have a lot of time. I've been sent here for you. Your doors are about to close again. I need to get you out of here. You want to get out of here? Uh, yeah, absolutely. All right, come with me. Let's go. Okay. All right, so, Kevin, what we're going to do is we're just going to head down here. I hope you're going to be able to climb because we're just going to... in prison it's that orange is definitely my color oh no 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 no! you want to leave everything behind if you bring that with you the dogs will be able to find you you'll be right back oh, here right 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 okay yeah. right all right okay. so all right team i have the package we're heading to the extraction zone right now kevin what i need you to do is what what are you doing this bed is perfect for me okay you think that we're gonna be able to get that through there? It contours to my every shape, okay? I can't sleep without it. Kevin, let's go. All right, let's go. Right, 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 okay, 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 yeah. All right, so. Oh, wait, hot dog Wednesday. What? Today's Tuesday, tomorrow's Wednesday. They, they serve hot dogs on Wednesday. Are you serious? Are you? Yeah, I, I can't miss that. Kevin, you can buy whatever food you want whenever we're out there. We just, we just need to go. What about Chester? Okay, what is that? Uh, okay, okay, just hold on. Oh, oh my gosh, what is it? Uh, Kevin! What is it now? Just Look, I've been saving these up for a long time, okay? Hey, Daryl, you still want to trade cigarettes? Yeah, that's cool. Look, I gotta trade these with Daryl, okay? What? Me and Kyle got this, like, cigarette business, and I can't just leave him now. Kevin, I don't think you understand this. Your door's gonna close again. I need to get your... Kevin, come out. We need to go right now. Please. Just leave everything? Kevin, you need to come with me right now. We need to go. But what, what, what could be better than all this? Kevin, you don't understand. They'll find the way I got in. I won't be able to come back for you. Yeah, I just need more time, okay? Kevin. Like, th this is my it's home. Just, Kevin, get out of this cell. I know. I can't, I can't just this leave. This is your only chance. I, I just need to think about this. This is, this is my home? Oh, Kevin. <sighs> Kevin, I... Kevin, I... Secure. Suspect is at large. At large, Gary P. Suspect is at large. No, wait, wait. Cell time secure. Next, get route. Suspect is at large. At large, Gary P. I'm not getting out there. Wait, wait. Wait, please. Don't leave me here, please. I can let it go. I can let it go, please! Wait, please! I promise I can let it go, please! Please don't leave me here! Please don't leave me here, please! I can let it go, I promise! I'm sorry! I'm sorry! I'm sorry, please! Israel chose the prison cell <laughs> instead of the freedom that God was trying to bring them to. And so I'm asking today, do we ever look at our former life and lust after the things that we left behind, the things that God delivered us from? Even though it was bondage, do we ever find ourselves wanting what we left? I'm telling you, there's times when God brings us individually and God brings us as a church through wilderness moments, and it's a time of growth. It's a time of faith building. It's a time of testing. God's looking to, to see what we will do, to see if we will seek His face or if we will seek His hand, if we'll run after His character or His nature and pursue a heartfelt relationship with Him, or is God somehow just some sugar daddy in the sky that we whine to every time we have a need? 
If we're only seeking his hand, we're never going to recognize his face. And if we're not passionately pursuing the heart of our Father with a heart that says, Father, show me your glory, you'll never receive the abundance from his hand that he actually wants to give you. In the New Testament, this was how the Pharisees didn't recognize God in the face of Jesus Christ. They were watching for his hand. The only thing that they were looking for was deliverance from Roman bondage. And so because all they were looking for was deliverance, they didn't recognize the face of God when he showed up. In our relationship with God, if our heart is after God, if we're loving Him and obeying Him and trusting Him, seeking Him, even in dry times, then I'm telling you God will raise up a Joshua generation from our midst that will walk into the promised land and harvest the nations. But even Joshua and his generation had a training ground. It was called the wilderness. And those wilderness moments sifted out the murmurers and the complainers and all the rebellious just like we separate the wheat from the chaff. Matthew 3, verse 12 says, God is ready to separate the chaff from the wheat, gathering the wheat into his barns, but burning the chaff with never-ending fire. And I'm saying that those people who are only seeking after and chasing after the promise instead of the promise maker are going to find themselves fainting and failing in the desert and in the wilderness. We're talking about how to survive the wilderness. And I'm saying it's one thing to seek God because He can help you, and it's another thing to seek God because He's Lord of all creation, because He died for you, because you love Him, and you're passionately pursuing Him. If your motive is selfish ambition, you're going to find yourself in a very shallow and immature relationship with God. And I believe, listen, I believe one that is going to make you unfit to enter into the eternal promised land. I'm telling you that we need to seek God for who He is, not because of what He can provide. And it's in this place that we will find God reaching out His hand to help us in everything that we do. But I'm saying to you boldly today, God owes you nothing. God owes you nothing. John chapter 6, we see Jesus feeds the 5,000 men, and afterwards He sends the disciples across the lake. He goes to pray. And then we see him walking on the water to meet up with them. And the moment his feet touch the boat, they're immediately on the other side. In verse 23, John 6, it says, The next day several boats landed where Jesus just fed that 5,000. 24 says, When the crowd saw that Jesus wasn't there, they got back in their boats and went to search for him further. 25 says they found Jesus on the other side. They're like, Hey, Jesus, man, when did you get here? 26, he said, you only want me because I fed you, not because you understood the miraculous signs. He said, you did not understand the signs. What do signs do? Let's think about like a street sign. What does a street sign do? It gives you direction. It gives you information. And if that sign's not followed, it could lead to your danger or even trouble with law. Agreed? So a sign never points to itself. It just gives you information. It gives you direction. Jesus was saying because their stomachs were growling, that was the only reason that they were chasing after him. The only reason they were looking for him was because their stomachs were growling. Not because they understood the signs. If they understood the sign, then they would have been chasing him because the sign showed he was the Messiah. Do you see the difference? There's a big difference in our lives if we're chasing him because he's the Messiah or because we're hungry. Oh, my stomach's growling. It was a good place to eat last time. How often today do we see people seeking Jesus for the wrong reasons? They're just looking for fire insurance, yet they still live the same life that they were living outside of that prayer. They only want Jesus on Sunday morning so that they can feel good, and then they forget about him on Monday morning. They only want his benefits or his blessing, but no relationship. They just, when they're sick, they want healed. And when they're broke, they want money. They're not in pursuit of him because they love him or because he died for them. He's just a resource in time of need. May it not be so in this house. You ever had a friend like that, that they only contact you when they are in need of something? That they only string you along because they, in, your mind, in their mind you have something to give them, they have something to gain from that relationship? As long as you keep looking good, make, making them look good, then they know your name. 
Perhaps it was your influence or your money or your material goods or some sort of knowledge that you may have possessed. You served a purpose for a time, and then they were done. If you've ever experienced that treatment, then you know how God feels. You know how it feels to be used. And I'm telling you that this selfish attitude has invaded and saturated our society as well as the church. And it is this mindset that divorce is at an all-time high across our nation and even in the church, that people are getting married for selfish reasons and then they fall apart. They fall apart because the expectations are not met. Christians, you know, we, we have these Christians that, you know, they're in the church and they call themselves a believer and they know it's a sin to kind of be in premarital sex or whatever. So they get married simply because they want to have sex and feel, lay their head on their pillow at night with a clear conscience. Not because they're in love or not because it's the right person. They're just in the mood. And so they fail when expectations are not met. They fail to realize that marriage is a covenant of love, not a paper contract. They get married because of what the partner can do for them instead of what they can do for them, to them. Do you understand? John 3.16, we see the ultimate true, honest love. God so loved that he gave. This is the motivation of love, should be. True motivation is giving. Not getting. True godly motivation is giving, not getting. And so when our partner that we married fails to meet the expectations, now we start seeking another. Ignoring the fact that in God's eyes you gave your word. You made a covenant, which is stronger than any paper contract. Come on, you out there today? What are we talking about? We're talking about wilderness moments that take place in our lives. How many times have we seen in the church where people get discontented with the way things are going and they backslide? Or they sear their conscience over and over again, doing things deliberately that they know is wrong and shipwreck their faith. How often have we seen that? How often do we see the love of many growing cold? Matthew 24, 12 says, And because of lawlessness, because lawlessness will abound. Are we seeing lawlessness in our nation anywhere? Uh, hello, Portland. Anywhere? Because lawlessness abounds, the love of many will grow cold, but he who endures to the end will be saved. Some people serve the Lord purely out of what they can get out of him, and as long as God keeps providing, as long as they stay on this mountaintop moment with the Lord, then they're happy. But the moment the Lord brings them through a valley moment, the moment there's a dry time, the moment that there's a wilderness moment, the motive of their heart is revealed. And they fall. Anytime that we focus on self-benefit in a relationship, destruction is inevitable. You there? That's good preaching, Pastor Bill. I appreciate it. We see this with Israel. The Lord delivers them from the land of from Pharaoh and they rejoice. Look at Exodus 15:20. It says Miriam, now listen, don't take this verse too long, too far. We will still never have tambourines in this church. Miriam gets her tambourine out and all the other women and they play their tambourines and they dance and they sing unto the Lord, "Oh, he's triumphed gloriously, the horse and the rider cast into the sea." They're overwhelmed by God's greatness. The, in the miraculous power fills their heart with joy. They're excited. They sing. They dance. God just delivered them. And three days later, the next verse, they encounter bitter waters and they start complaining. Moses led the people away from the Red Sea. Where's that? Where the miracle just took place. Where they're singing and dancing and shaking their tambourines. From there into the desert. What's that? The wilderness. They travel for three days. They come to an oasis where the water is bitter, according to 23, and 24 says they start complaining. They turned against their leader and started demanding their own way. They think this is McDonald's. Well, what are we going to drink? Do they really think that this all-powerful God who just did all these signs and wonders to get them out of Egypt, who just split the Red Sea and devoured their enemy, somehow he can't fix bitter water? 
Come on. They start doubting. They start complaining. God turns the water sweet, and just a few days later, they're whining about what to eat. Next chapter, 16, verse 2 says, The whole community of Israel is now complaining to Moses and Aaron. Oh, if you just killed us back in Egypt, they moaned. There we sat around pots filled with meat. We ate all the bread that we wanted. You brought us in the wilderness to starve to death. Listen, this girl likes to eat. You ever been out with this girl? We took her to eat one day, and she ordered half the menu at Taco Bell. I'm not joking. I'm just picking on you. That was before you were pregnant, right? <laughs> I like to eat, too, is what I'm saying. But can you imagine getting to the place where you're actually pointed a crooked, nasty finger at God and saying, feed me now. They're complaining to Moses. Moses, just a few days ago, Moses was your hero. What are you doing? In verse 8, 16 verse 8, Moses has to remind them, what have we done? You're not complaining against us. You're complaining to the Lord. Can you imagine looking God straight in the face and whine and complain about what he's doing? Hopefully we're not there, but that's what they're doing. we got to understand, no matter what the circumstance is before you, God has not lost his power. Listen, God is still firmly seated on his throne. He has never been defeated, and he's never got it wrong. <laughs> and he's still in control. And let me even say this. that Listen, I, regardless of what America does, heaven's economy and heaven's ruling is not based on what America does. Listen to me. The government is not in control. God is. We need to be very careful to not get disgruntled and start whining and complaining like Israel did in these dry times, in these wilderness moments. Don't complain. Don't murmur. Don't start blaming the leadership. Listen, I'm telling you, God is weighing the heart of the church. God is weighing the heart of every individual that says, I'm a Christian. And our prayer is, is that we're going to seek him now more than ever in these moments when we go through them. That God, remember God is good in the good times and in the bad times, regardless of circumstance. We pray that, we, that our hearts are found chasing after Him in these moments, that we are secure and satisfied in our relationship with Him, understanding again that these wilderness moments are revealing motives in our hearts, revealing our true nature, stirring things to the top that need to be scraped off, separating selfish ambitions from godly desires. That's what these wilderness moments are doing. You need them. And I pray that we understand, listen, church, you're not perfect. We are not perfect. We have not arrived. We have a lot of work to do still. And we pray that we begin to ask the Holy Spirit to sort out our motives and to separate things that have been holding us back from, for years for years, we've been trying to get to a place. What's holding us back? Maybe it's we're going around the same mountain because we didn't learn the lesson the first time. And I'm saying that when we get this thing figured out and we get it worked out and the Holy Spirit shows us what we need to change, may that thing, may that moment be a springboard that propels us forward to the destiny that God has in store for our lives. That we will be servants that, as Colossians 3, 2 says, that our minds are set on things above and not on the things of this earth. May our purpose be to love God and love people. May our purpose be to be stronger together. May we pursue a life-changing, spirit-empowered relationship with our Creator. Where our heart is, we want to advance the kingdom at all, at all costs. Knowing that when we do, everything else is going to fall into place as a result of a proper relationship with Jesus Christ. Do you receive it today? Father, in the matchless name of Jesus, I pray that wisdom begins to invade our hearts and minds right now. By the Holy Ghost, Father, begin to reveal to us. I, I pray that we even begin to look back at past moments when, we, when we've wondered what we were doing and where we were going. And God, are you really even in control right now? What's happening? I don't understand this moment. I pray that we would begin to evaluate with the wisdom of the Holy Ghost. 
Father, what were you trying to, to teach me or train me or purge out of me in that moment, Father? Did I, did I get it? <laughs> am, or am I still going around the mountain again? Father, give us the wisdom and the understanding to know you have a purpose. And that these moments are not our destination. It's just training ground. Help us, Father, to press all the way through and be everything that you created us to be in Jesus' name. You receive it? I call you blessed.